Emma, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Um, we've got a lot to talk about because you've had a, a, a long and quite varied career, but I want to start by asking you why law all, all, all those years ago? Why did you choose law over all the things you could have done? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was not a joke. <laughs> you will see the point. I was an undergraduate at Georgia. I couldn't figure out what to major in. Uh, I changed majors eight times. And one of my fraternity brothers said, why don't you try law school? Then Georgia had a combined degree program. And I could use the first year of law school as the last year of undergraduate school. And so I went to law school with no intention of being a lawyer, uh, but with an idea that it was a good background for something else, whatever that else was. Uh, I was also, uh, it was pre uh, the end of the Korean War, pre Vietnam War, and I was in an Air ROTC program, and soon I was going to get drafted into the Air Force. So I went to law school with no intention of being a lawyer and completing the degree. It turned out that I liked law school. I found the first year, as I'm sure you did, uh, a bit of a culture shock because it was so utterly different from undergraduate school. Uh, but I stayed, so forget all this stuff about long range planning. Uh, it worked out, and I'm glad I ended up with that career choice. But it certainly was not a grand plan designed from childhood to be a lawyer. Was there something that, some event or something that happened that where it clicked and you thought, I really think I want to try this lawyer business? Well, I, I found the subject matter interesting. I found it was an entirely different way of thinking from taking an undergraduate course in which you were learning dates, collected data. You were having to learn critical thinking in a very uh, challenging way. And I liked it. And as if you got into it, you found that some of the subject matters were interesting, uh, particularly constitutional law was interesting, criminal law was very interesting. I have to confess, real property law didn't exactly excite me. <laughs> They're taking property right now. <laughs> yeah, the rule in Shelley's case, the rule in Wiles case, have escaped me over the years, and I have escaped them, so. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. Um, well, you, you, you've done a lot of different things uh, over your career, and I, I want to have a chance to talk about all of them. I mean, you founded your own firm, you've been highly successful, you've done pro bono work, you've worked on policy questions, but I, I think where I want to begin is um, with your work regarding voting rights. And, and here, here's why I want to start there, because in a sense, it, it can create some bookends for us at the beginning of your career, not at the end, but the present, right? So early in your career, you, you were involved, I want to make sure I get this case right, Westbury versus Sanders before the Supreme Court of the United States involving the congressional districts in Georgia. And you argued that case at age 26. What was that like? Uh, it was fun. The, <laughs> uh, you'd have to understand all of you would, are too young to have known this, but Georgia operated under the equivalent of the Electoral College, under which the representation of the General Assembly was terribly malapportioned and it carried over to the governor's race. The six largest counties in Georgia each had three members of the State House and double that in terms of what we call county unit votes, the equivalent of the Electoral College. The next 30 had four, and the remaining 130 counties, 125 counties, wherever it was, had two. So that Eccles County, for example, on the Georgia-Florida line in 1960 had a population of 1,876 people. It had two county unit votes in the election of governor the equivalent of Idaho or Wyoming's contribution to the Electoral College. 
Fulton County, which obviously was Atlanta, had 556,000 people. It had six county unit votes, which meant the governors were always elected by rural forces of Georgia, which if you can imagine at that period of time was the reactionary force to everything going on from school desegregation to economic development to education and everything else. So uh, I got interested in the topic. I had an opportunity uh, after a clerkship to spend a year at Harvard in the master's program in which my master's thesis was going to be a cutting edge paper as to how one might challenge the county unit system in federal courts. <coughs> at that point in time, the federal courts were operating under a 1944 dictum written by Felix Frankfurter that said that all issues involving elections were political questions, that the federal judiciary was too pristine and couldn't get their roads dirty uh, by going into the political thicket where they might be scratched by briars. <clears throat> and so that whole area was out of bounds. Well, just as I was finish, finishing what I thought was this great cutting-edge paper as to how that might be challenged, the Supreme Court decided something called Baker against Carr, which was a 1962 decision uh, from Tennessee in which the court, by a 6-3 majority, ruled that in fact the federal courts could take jurisdiction. And my paper overnight became a rear guard action Oh, um, uh, being subsumed by the Baker decision. But when I returned to Atlanta, there were three cases pending in the wake of Baker. There was one challenge in the state legislature. There was one challenge in the county unit system. And the third case was Westbury v. Sanders, in which two young lawyers in Atlanta who were JCs brought a suit to challenge congressional districts. They lost in the district court uh, with a 2-1 opinion written by a person alumnus, Griffin Bell, who was then on the Fifth Circuit. And because I'd done all this work, I got introduced as a very young lawyer to these people working on these cases. And candidly took over Westbury, which they had lost, filed the jurisdiction in the state of the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court took it. And I argued it in November of 1963. Uh, four days before the Kennedy assassination, uh, which is a date we all remember. And uh, it was probably not the best judgment for me to argue the case, uh, being as young and inexperienced as I was. But, you know, angels fly to tread where fools fear to tread, or vice versa. And uh, I did, and it turned out okay. Uh, and February of 1964, the court came out with a 6-3 opinion by, written by Justice Hugo Black, which held that under Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution, members of Congress within a state had to be apportioned based on population. One person, one vote rule came out of that case. And five months later, in the legislative cases, Reynolds against Sims and three others, uh, the court applied the same principles to state legislative districts. So as a result, the Georgia General Assembly in both houses had to be reapportioned. And that is why you have equal representation on a population basis in both state legislatures and congressional districts. Talk for a minute about, if you would, about me interrupt you. Talk a minute about the argument itself. Uh, and how you felt as a young lawyer standing in front of those justices? Well, the Supreme Court is you know, an awesome place in many respects. Uh, this was the Warren Court, the same court had, that had ruled in Brown v. Board of Education and was particularly compared in comparison to courts in the last 30 years a progressive court that believed that the law was an instrument for reform and not protection of property interest per se or 
they did not believe in a calcified constitution frozen in time in whatever James Madison thought in 1787 when the federal convention uh, was held and thus dealt with a number of issues that had long been uh, neglected by the federal courts and in that period of time you had the one person one vote rule which revolutionized both state and congressional elections which were terribly malapportioned. In Georgia, for example, Georgia's congressional districts had not been reapportioned since 1930, and this was 1960. In Alabama and Tennessee, their state legislative districts hadn't been reapportioned since 1900, even though their state constitutions required it. And so th that was a, a major reform of the whole electoral process. And the Georgia County unit system fell so that you have a popularly elected governor and not one elected by this county unit system that skewed all the votes to the rural areas. Uh, I don't remember being particularly intimidated by the court. I had argued some cases in the Court of Appeals, uh, the federal courts of appeals before that, and I will offer those as an object lesson for all of you. We talk about pro bono work, but a lot of that is great training for you as a young lawyer that you will not get in the ordinary course of the practice at a significant law firm because a client who is a paying client isn't going to pay a rookie to go to the federal courts of appeals on a case of importance. It just ain't going to happen. Uh, so the first year that I was practicing, it, I was then at Kilpatrick, Cody, Rogers, McClatchy, Regenstein in Atlanta, which was then a mere 20-lawyer firm. Uh, I got appointed in three court-appointed cases to represent inmates at the Atlanta Federal Pen on federal habeas corpus, actually it's technically 2255 cases, challenging some part of their convictions or incarcerations. And so got to argue three cases in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, that I wrote the brief in. Uh, I went up and argued the case. Uh, no partner told me how to write the brief or that he'd do the argument for me or anything else. And it turned out one all three of them, which will get you a lot of prison mail. But it also, <laughs> also gave me experience in a, in a federal appellate court with, a, with serious matters vastly years ahead of where I would have gotten it in the ordinary course of practice at Kilpatrick Cody. I had argued more cases in the federal courts of appeals than most partners in that firm. And all the associates in my first year of practice. So it was serendipitous in the second year when I had the opportunity to go to the Supreme Court. I had been in some form of combat, not at the Supreme Court level, but federal courts of appeals were not particularly user friendly uh, in habeas corpus cases. Uh, so it, it was a great opportunity and while it was a pro bono service, sacrificial, all that sort of thing related to uh, good works that lawyers want to do free. It was great training for me. It was an opportunity that I would not have had had I stuck to the firm's ordinary billable work of preventing small loan company or representing small loan companies and collecting overdue debts from people who had borrowed a little money from them. Well, so you did your first Supreme Court argument in November of 1963. Your next Supreme Court argument is next month. Can you talk a little bit about that case so the students get a little context here? Well, the, the next case is clearly on a par with Westbury. Westbury changed the face of Congress because Congress went all over the country had been elected from basically rurally dominated districts that had not been reapportioned for years and so forth. The 
the case we're currently working on is from North Carolina. It is a partisan gerrymandering case. And you have read a great deal recently about partisan gerrymandering. But it essentially involves whichever political party is in power using voting history data, how people vote in the smallest areas in which data is recorded, called voter tabulation districts, and then stacking the political deck by sorting those districts out as to whether they're Democratic or Republican. And you can, with great precision, with the help of particularly computers and a program called Maptitude, draw districts that are continuous, compact, that don't look strange or anything else, that are absolutely equal in population, that screw one political party or the other and exclude them from power. In North Carolina, the Republicans took control of the legislature in 2010 and set out to gerrymander the congressional districts and convert North Carolina, which was a 50-50 state and still is, which had a 7-6 Democratic majority in the delegation to a 10-3 by gerrymandering the districts. Well, the districts got held invalid because they used racial quotas for two of the districts, and which violated the Equal Protection Clause. So in 216, they came back and adopted a new plan in which they adopted written criteria that said, this is going to be a partisan gerrymander. We're going to use political data, meaning voting history data, to preserve the current 10-3 Republican majority. Well, we challenged that in the federal district court in 216 before a three-judge court on four constitutional grounds. One, under the First Amendment, because if, for those of you who have not yet had con law, the First Amendment prohibits viewpoint discrimination, prohibits government from discriminating against people in any respect based on their political beliefs, their religious beliefs, uh, their viewpoints about issues. We challenged it under the Equal Protection Clause, which is equal protection of the law, which this is obviously favoring Republicans over Democrats. But also under Article I, Section 2, which was the basis of Westbury Sanders, in Article 1, Section 4, which is the provision that says states, legislatures have, shall determine the time, places, and manner of election of members of the House of Representatives. Well, the Supreme Court, in two cases that have been overlooked by everybody but us, said this is only a delegation of power to the states to adopt procedural rules. This is not a delegation of the power to dictate electoral outcomes or favor or disfavor a class of candidates. But what is a partisan gerrymander but an attempt by the legislature to dictate in what are called crack districts in North Carolina that Republicans will win those 10 specific districts and that Democrats will win the other three districts which would impact the supermajorities of Democrats. Or if you want to look at it on the other part of the sentence, favoring or disfavoring a class of candidates. Well, if you're running in the first congressional district, which the in North Carolina, which has been packed with a 70 percent Democratic majority, you know who's going to win that election. The Democratic incumbent's going to win. The Republican has no chance. Republican voters are worth nothing in that district, and the general election is a formality. Conversely, if you're in one of the ten districts that have been ethnically cleansed of Democratic voters, you know a Republican's going to win those districts. And guess what? In 218, a wave election, the gerrymander held. Ten Republicans, three Democrats, even though the split in the vote was basically 51-49, although there is one district, as you know, in which the questions of absentee ballot fraud, which may be changed. But anyway, it, it is being brought as a test case. Well, the Supreme Court for the last 30 years has said, this is a very complicated problem. We agree this is antithetical to the democratic process, but nobody has proposed a, quote, manageable constitutional standard 
on which to rule on these issues. Well, we have, we did in the three-judge court, in our case, unanimously ruled that the districts in North Carolina had been unconstitutionally apportioned in an opinion that was a mere 214 pages long. Uh, the Supreme Court remanded it for reconsideration in the light of the case from Wisconsin, and the court entered a new opinion that is now 321 pages long. And so it is up in the Supreme Court along with the case from Maryland, which we also worked on, which is, guess what, a Democratic gerrymander of a single Republican congressional district. So that issue is, is probably, from a, dem from a pure democracy representative government point of view, the most important case in the Supreme Court this term of court, and will determine in the future whether or not either political party, when they gain power, can essentially entrench itself on political power and exclude the other from, from gaining power by ger gerrymandering the districts. It can be done very effectively. The Republican majority in Congress since 212 is solely responsible to the gerrymandering of the districts in five states, North Carolina, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. That accounts for the entire margin. If you had apportioned members of the House in those states based on some proportional representation to how the popular vote broke down in those states, the Republicans would never have had a majority in the House of Representatives for the last decade. Well, we're going to look forward to seeing how that case is decided, and when it is decided, I'll make sure the students all uh, have the chance to, uh, to see the opinion. I want to switch gears uh, for a minute uh, and ask you about another uh, case that you uh, that you handled. You had, you represented one of the Guantanamo detainees, um, and uh, if I pronounce this right, Muhammad Abdallah Al Ansi. Actually, I represented two of them. Two of them. <laughs> All right. Well, one of the things the students are learning, are learning here is that part of being a professional is, is keeping your eye on public service. And part of that is representing people who are unpopular. Uh, and it's safe to say that Guantanamo detainees were not popular people in the United States. And yet a number of lawyers came out to defend them. Could you talk a little bit about that and, and what, what that experience was like and why you did it? Well, you will get more of this in kind of law and law school. But you've got to believe that the justice system core is, just as the word implies, justice. That there are procedures, that there's some element of fairness in all of this, that you have impartial courts applying impartial rules to get a fair result. Guantanamo is, along with the Japanese exclusion cases, probably the greatest departure from the constitutional system that we all believe in that you have ever seen. You've not had con law, but in, during World War II, the United States declared all people of Japanese descent on the West Coast to be security risk, rounded them up, put them in concentration camps in the high desert in Nevada and California and those people and kept them for the duration of the war, without trial, without anything, solely based on their Japanese history. Those cases went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court chickened out, chickened out, deferred to the military authorities, refused to rule that these people who were American citizens in America had any due process rights to challenge their det detention. The court has subsequently recognized that is probably, along with Dred Scott and a few other cases, the biggest blight on judicial jurisprudence in the United States and everything the legal system is supposed to stand for. Well, the Guantanamo cases are another example. 
we all know about the war in Afghanistan and so forth. What you don't know is that it was a cottage industry in Pakistan to sell people who were non-Afghanis who ended up in Afghanistan for various reasons to the CIA as supposed Al-Qaeda agents. And the U.S. took them into custody uh, <coughs> in places like Abu Ghraib, in many instances tortured them, uh, took them to Guantanamo, and Guantanamo was selected by the Bush administration because it was thought to be a judicial black hole. That is, that the federal courts in the United States could not exercise jurisdiction. The Constitution didn't apply. We could ignore the Geneva Conventions. We could ignore the rules of war. And we could hold them for however long we wanted to. And we could do any goddamn thing to them we wanted to. And we did. Al Anzi uh, was a, he was a <coughs> Yemeni who went to Pakistan, according to him, to teach the Quran to children. Uh, I, I'm candidly skeptical of the explanation, but whether he was or was not involved in the activity, when he was taken by the Pakistanis, he was in Pakistan, turned over to the U.S., theoretically considered with the worst of the worst and taken to Guantanamo, among other things that happened to him was he was waterboarded, except the, uh, their method of waterboarding was to take him outside in midwinter in Afghanistan and put him down on a stone table and hold his head under the water in a barrel at the end of the table until he was faced with drowning. He had no fingernails and he had no toenails. I personally examined those. Uh, they used electric shock treatment, uh, a electric generator which they hooked up to various body parts, which I won't name, to try to extract a confession. And the result was that if you confessed, that proved you were in Al-Qaeda. If you didn't confess, that also proved you were in Al-Qaeda because you had been trained to resist interrogation. I've seen all of the super duper secret documents which they had on him and they had nothing. They held him there for 11 years before he was released. Well, we filed habeas corpus on his behalf. The federal courts in the District of Columbia, notwithstanding the Supreme Court had ruled that these petitioners had a right to challenge their detention under habeas corpus, the Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia reversed every case that the petitioners won and affirmed every case that the petitioners lost and essentially said if there is a piece of paper in which some government person said they had grounds to hold it, that was presumed to be true and the since the petitioner couldn't depose anybody, uh, he couldn't disprove it. So those cases, to say I'm bitter about those cases is an understatement. We lawyers tried as hard as we could, and dozens of lawyers all over the country did, with big firms and small firms for those cases, and ran into a stone wall, not of the district court level in D.C., but the court of appeals level of ideologues, some of whom I can name and one of whom is on the, two of whom are on the Supreme Court, including John Roberts, who essentially abdicated all judicial responsibility in those cases and the Supreme Court, after ruling in four cases in favor of the petitioners, refused to review any of those cases and uh, the, the whole episode is a travesty that for a legal system that holds itself up as an example to the world of how a legal system is supposed to work is a total abdication of the process. And Al Lindsay was released recently. We represented earlier a guy named Arachidi, who was a Moroccan 
who was a cook who was again sold by the Pakistanis to the CIA and held for seven or eight years. Uh, the government in those cases takes a position, you know, this is all highly classified. You, they wouldn't even tell you well or not they were holding the guy there. And to, as you got into the case, you normally in discovery in cases get documents from the other side. Well, any documents we got from the government, you had to go to a super duper secret room in Washington after you'd gotten a security clearance, you could only look at the documents there and could not make notes that you could take out of the super duper secret room. If you had a hearing, the documents were brought in a plain brown envelope like pornography to the court by a security officer, opened in a sealed courtroom so you could try to use them. Uh, you, you really thought you could walk through the looking glass in terms of that process. The government, in my view, lied and got away with lying in those cases. The government took the position, and all of you have watched enough TV to realize how silly this is. These are people that were being held as security risk, supposedly for their intelligence value. They were interrogated thousands of times. The government claimed that they did not make one paper recording, one video, one verbatim transcript of any of those interrogations. They only had what the translator told an American that what he thought the guy had said. And what was produced to us was a single summary sentence of thousands of interrogations, hundreds of hours, and so forth, that supposedly supported the government's position. If you were arrested on a drunk driving offense in Hay Hira, you would probably be interrogated on video by the local sheriff in any significant crime. If you took a deposition in any civil case with more than $100 involved, you're going to have a court reporter and a verbatim transcript so that you can record what the adversary said, cross-examine it, and so forth. The U.S. government holding people for supposedly is the worst of the worst to gain intelligence to help us fight the war on terror claims not to have done any of that when there are government documents that show the opposite is true and the courts would not go into it. So uh, that's a terrible ep episode. But the lawyers who stood up in those cases did absolutely the right thing. And hundreds of law firms spent millions of dollars of hours of pro bono time trying to make the justice system work as the Constitution intended it to work. And we failed. The courts failed us. It was not the bar that failed. It was the federal judiciary that failed. And I, want to, I want to give the students a chance to get a feel for the, 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 the broader range of your career. I mean, you haven't spent your entire career just doing these kinds of, of, of high profile, largely pro bono matters. Uh, you started at what was then a big firm. Now it's laughable to think 20 lawyers is a big firm. But when you were 40 years old, you founded your own firm. And you have been, uh, the firm has been extremely successful doing commercial litigation, antitrust litigation, um, <coughs> the, the, the business side of, 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 of litigation work. Can you talk a little bit about that side of your career and what you found rewarding uh, about that and about founding and running your own firm these, these many years? Well, the <coughs> Pro bono work I refer to as my playtime. I tell people that other people play golf, I sue people. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is, if you're going to be a private practice uh, and you're going to support a family and so on, you have to balance conflicting demands. And you can't spend all your time on your playtime. On the other hand, the, uh, our, our firm does nothing but complex, 
commercial litigation of various kinds, both trial and appellate litigation. Uh, that is really interesting. It's really challenging. You're playing in a fast pitch league. Uh, those are very demanding cases that take a vast amount of time and effort on the part of a lot of people. And you the nice thing about a litigation practice is that no two cases are alike. And you're learning the nuts and bolts of the details of how an industry would operate or how a particular transaction occurs or some medical procedure. I defended a patent case involving, and I'll, I'll give it to you literally, transrectal biopsies of the male prostate with long needles and things like that. And I learned more about prostate cancer than I care to know, uh, <laughs> but subsequently was diagnosed with it. Uh, so there is a balance, but there are opportunities to do high quality legal work, to be extraordinarily well paid for, depending on whether you win or lose sometimes. Uh, and to do these other things as well. One of the things that I have thought important, and, and let me give the old Kilpatrick firm credit, I was allowed as a very young associate to get involved in some very controversial cases on a pro bono basis that a lot of the corporate clients, if they had been asked, would not have approved of, and never got a peep of disapproval from the firm. They didn't cut my workload in order to do it. That was night, weekend work, as it is with us. But we do not let clients tell us the kinds of cases we can handle. And you may remember when the Guantanamo cases first came up, one of the people in the Bush administration urged corporate clients to boycott the law firms that were representing Guantanamo detainees and there was immediately some pushback on that. But if you're going to do those cases, you just got to face the fact that there are going to be people who disagree with you. And they don't think that people like the Guantanamo inmates should have a day in court, or don't think somebody like Gary Nelson, who was convicted of murder, should be released. Uh, but your job in the legal system is to be an advocate to make the system work, to make sure that the person is properly, if they're in jail, properly convicted, or if you're defending a civil case, or you're prosecuting a civil case, to make sure that your client has the best day in court they can have, and a fair decision that you have put heart and soul into to achieve. And this is not one of these things you can do casually. You've got somebody's life in your hand if you're doing criminal work. You've got their financial welfare in their hand, whether you're representing them as a plaintiff in a personal injury case in which they've been horribly damaged, or whether you're representing a defendant in a business case whose very survival may depend on whether you win or lose. And so you're taking on a real responsibility. And but it is it is both challenging and it is rewarding. It is painful. You, you will remember the wins, but you remember the losses much more because the losses hurt a lot. The lows of losing are much lower than the highs of winning. But it is something that's very demanding. I tried a case in Tampa uh, in the more than 10 years ago now that lasted for five months before a jury it was a corporate dispute involving four or five hundred millions of dollars in which the other side was an eight billion dollar company trying to squash a competitor that we represented and we fortunately won. But that's the kind of thing that to be a lawyer you really relish the opportunity in those cases. But if you're going to let other people tell you the kinds of cases you can take, or you can't take a case for 
somebody who can't pay you who deserves a day in court because of their political views and they want to force their views on you. Uh, you're not really the sort of professional, independent lawyer that at least I would want you to be. And I think you, in your own quiet moments, would want to be yourself. And there, there are clearly costs to those things. I have brought cases that I can tell you with <coughs> absolute certainty cost my law firm tens of millions of dollars, either in referrals or direct client representation. Uh, it has that price, but it is a price, in my view, that is well worth paying and we have survived, maybe not because of it, maybe in spite of it, but you know, we are the kinds of lawyers we want to be. And if you want to be a kind of lawyer that is timid and lets clients tell you what you can do and what you can't do for other people, uh, you're probably in the wrong profession. Yeah, but I've got a long list of questions that I'm and I, but I'm going to stop uh, unless I, I, I have to ask them. Um, I'd like to turn it to the students uh, and see what questions they have for you um, in, in the time remaining. So. What questions do you all have for Mr. Bonder? Yes, sir. Uh, so naturally, your career has come with some stress. Um, how have you dealt with that over the years? Just get it out. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, yeah, clearly, clearly, uh, it is a stressful career. There's no question about it. And you know there are a lot of lawyer alcoholics, there are a lot of lawyer suicides. Uh, but at the same time, you just, it's like any other competition. You basically have to rely on both yourself and your colleagues to do the best you can. And as long as you've given it your best, you're going to lose some cases. I've lost cases that I should not have lost. The courts were wrong, I was right, I'm still right. <laughs> I make no apology for that. Uh, but it, 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 it does require work. This, this, is not a, this is not a casual occupation. This is not a nine to five job. You take it home with you and you wake up in the middle of the night wondering, damn, if I missed a filing deadline. <laughs> Uh, that's the nightmare that we all had. Uh, but with concentrated work, you can be an enormous success at this. But it, it is, you know, I kid you not, this is, if you want to do something casually, go sell insurance or go in the advertising business or something like that. This is not that kind of a job because it is demanding. I found as a young lawyer, I did reasonably well in law school. When I got to Kilpatrick as a young associate, I thought I was pretty damn smart <laughs> until anything I drafted came back, they marked it with a red pen and it looked like it had been dipped in blood. <laughs> <laughs> and you realize that you really had to up your game. But that was great training, and I am indebted for it. And when I do the same thing to a younger associate, I don't apologize for it. It's just a matter of learning that you're playing in a fast-pitch league, and you've got to up your game, and you've got to come playing your A game every day. Yes, sir. So what are some of the obligations or aspects of lawyering that you dealt with early in your career that you had to deal with less or that changed as you moved throughout your career? Well, early in my career, I was a young associate at Kilpatrick, which was a great law firm. We had really fine lawyers with damn high standards. Uh, the 
you did not have your own office. We were in what was called the mole hole, which was a office in which the four or five young associates with no windows next to the library, and you did a lot of writing and so on, uh, as well as handling a lot of small cases. With those intellectually challenging cases, for that level of my experience in the career, they were intellectually challenging. The first time you go to the state court of Fulton County in a little civil suit that you've never tried a case before, it is about as stressful as going to the Supreme Court of the U.S. Uh, but that is part of the, the learning experience. What's the advantage of being an older lawyer? The advantage is, and I can pick and choose, there are a lot of things that I would just basically say I don't want to be involved with. I don't want to waste my time on those cases. Uh, sometimes they're pain cases. Sometimes they're clients that you meet that even though they want to pay you very well, you may be able to figure out in advance that there's somebody you can never please no matter what you do, at which point you refer them to the person in the bar you like least. <laughs> uh, but it is you progress in the profession, you do less of the things that you don't want to do and delegate that. But our view, in our firm is a little different from a lot of others. Uh, when we have major litigation, we probably have only one partner and one associate on it, and they would be working more or less at an equal level than at a purely vertical level in which the partners on Mount Everest are getting distant reports of what's going on in the field. Uh, I think you need to be involved in the day-to-day -day work and preparation of the case and working with young lawyers to do the same thing so that you all know all about the case instead of your reporting to me what you've done and I've never even seen the witnesses. Does that help? Yes, sir. Excuse me. No, no, that's okay. I'm trying to give this side of the room a chance, yeah. too. So Go ahead. Since I have my back. Here. Yes, sir. I have a two-part question. Um, what were the outcomes of your Gitmo cases? And then if you were to advise the Attorney General and the President going forward, uh, from a constitutional perspective, what would be your proposed alternative to Gitmo? The, I would, let me pick the second first. If I'd been the Attorney General, I would never have had a Gitmo. If you wanted to try these people as war criminals, I would bring them to the U.S. courts. I'd try them under the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, as we have done with many espionage cases, many terrorist cases uh, in federal courts throughout the country. Uh, the outcome of all the Gitmo cases was that despite all the efforts we made, we did not accomplish anything for the prisoners. No prisoner was released as a result of a favorable legal ruling. Every favorable legal ruling was reversed. Every unfavorable legal ruling was affirmed. And I'll give you the example of Arachidi. He was the guy who was a cook who was a Moroccan who was sold by the Pakistanis to the CIA spent six or seven years in Gitmo. Uh, we brought habeas corpus on his behalf. The federal court simply stayed our ruling, which our case pending outcomes in cases in the Supreme Court, which simply meant it was put in the refrigerator and frozen. And then one day in 207, 208, I got an email from the government. The government has made a determination to release INS 127. That was his number at Gitmo. This is not to suggest he's not a threat to the security of the United States, or that he's not a terrorist. We're going to release him anyway. And so we then said, well, how can we facilitate this? He was Moroccan. Uh, and it turned out that Jason Carter, who you may or may not know, uh, who is Jimmy Carter's grandson and was the <laughs> associate, his office was next to mine. And we were speculating 
how do we get in touch with the government of Morocco? And Jason said, well, I know the king of Morocco. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. and, and through the Carter Center, they communicated with the Moroccan government, and within two weeks, Arachidi was, uh, they told the State Department they'd take Arachidi back. He was brought home and released by them, and has since written a book about his experience. One of the funny side stories of that was when you first get one of these cases, mine came from the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York. Uh, they didn't even know whether he was being held. His family in Morocco had heard from somebody that there was somebody named Ahmed the Cook being held at Guantanamo. So you call the government and say, we've been asked by the family to represent this guy. Can you tell me whether he's being held at Guantanamo? No, that's classified. Well, how can I file habeas corpus if I don't have the facts to know whether you're even holding him? It's kind of silly for me to file it if you're not holding him. We can't tell you it's classified. So you have to get a security clearance, file a lawsuit alleging he's being held without knowing he's there, and then, of course, they admit he's there. Well, he was supposed to be the worst of the worst. He was known as the colonel within Guantanamo, and that was supposed to mean he was some kind of leader. And this was all top secret, super duper room, classified, and so on. Well, about three or four years in his detention, an article appeared in the New York Times Sunday Supplement, you know, the magazine section of the Times, in which they were interviewing the commandant at Guantanamo. And he was describing his efforts to negotiate with the prisoners to get more cooperation in return for more privilege. And guess who he was negotiating with? The colonel, whom he named Ahmed Arachidi. <laughs> this top secret worst of the worst. They, they produced no evidence that he was anything other than a nobody. And ultimately released him as a nobody. And he's gone back to Morocco as a nobody. And he spent seven or eight years of his life, life in solitary confinement at Gitmo, which is uh, not a place for a beach vacation, I can assure you. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, so could you speak about um, what has motivated you over the years to uh, do these things that seemingly go against um, the public? Um, uh, public view, so representing uh, Gitmo detainees, um, causing trouble in North Carolina. <laughs> Can you talk about what has motivated you to even pursue those types of cases? It's hard, you know, hard to psychoanalyze yourself. Let me, let me try. I believe deeply in the justice system. I hate bullies, and I hate for the system to be unjust. I represented Gary Nelson, who was convicted of rape, murder, sodomy of a six-year-old child in Savannah in 1978. We spent 12 years on that case. He was wrongfully convicted. He was inadequately represented. But worse than that, the prosecution in Savannah violated every known constitutional right you've ever heard of including suppressing evidence, knowing use of perjured testimony to get a conviction. Uh, <coughs> fighting for somebody like that who can't possibly afford lawyers, particularly lawyers who charge the outrageous sums that we charge our certain clients, uh, is important. And if the justice system is to work, if it's to mean anything, if it's to live up to the word justice, people like you and I and all of you have got to say, that's my job to correct those injustices and to take those cases. You may lose one. The Nelson case, he had been sent, he was on death row for 12 years. Uh, he, I was convinced, and and virtually every young lawyer in my office worked on that case at one time or another, doing something. He became a human being today. The 
secretarial staff would send him yarn because he learned to crochet while he was in prison so he could earn cigarette and candy money. He would knit baby blankets and baby sweaters for, for shower gifts for the secretarial staff. He, he was a real person. And I was convinced if we had lost that a number of our young lawyers would have left the firm and say to hell with practicing law because there is no justice in this system. And others would have needed psychiatric help just because of their attachment to it. We fortunately were able to win. We, habeas was granted. I argued that in the Georgia Supreme Court the day after I ran the Boston Marathon, uh, in, in, uh, which is another story. I didn't win, <laughs> but I did finish uh, in about four hours. Uh, but Gary was released in 1991. We relocated him to Athens with the help of the School of Social Work from Savannah because my theory was if a cat went missing in Savannah, he would be the number one suspect. He has lived a blameless life since then and that was really worth the effort and worth the investment by the firm, the, the firm time, and everybody who worked on it thought that this is why I really wanted to be a lawyer. And it was not just the pain cases, and the pain cases are important. I think those are really important. It feels good you know, to get a check every month, but it also feels good to do something somebody that nobody else is going to help. Time for one more and you've got one minute to answer it. Yes, sir. Uh, I was just interested in how um, the social unrest of the 1960s kind of helped mold you as a person or a lawyer. Can you speak to anything specific in that era? Kind of yeah, that was a lot. <laughs> Remember, you have one minute. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> One of the things that, candidly, I regret was that there were practically no Georgia lawyers, no white Georgia lawyers with the, with the large firms involved in the civil rights movement in the early 60s, when others were going to Mississippi as part of Freedom Summer and things like that. Uh, but that was a period of great change. It was a period in which the courts were a leader in reform, not an obstacle to reform. And that is a major change in the way the, the federal courts have performed since then. And you can tell which side of that equation I'm on. I'm not a strict constructionist who believes that the law ought to be ossified in the state that it was in 1789, in which there are a lot of things that went on that would not be acceptable today. And you can stay around for a few minutes and chat. Sure. All right. Join me in thanking.